Hello, this is Dr. Stijn van Kessel from Queen Mary University. I'm, I'm joined again by Dr. Leonie de Jonge from Groningen University. Uh, and today uh, we're going to talk about the article which is a required reading for, for my students. Uh, the Populist Radical Right and the Media and the Benelux, Friend or Foe, an, an article that you published in the International Journal of Press Politics uh, just a year ago. Or so. So this is uh, about specifically how the media reacts to populist radical right parties, or whether they, uh, yeah, the kind of the posture that they take towards these insurgents, if you, if you like. So uh, if you, as you write yourself, you analyze the various ways in which the media choose to deal with right-wing populist parties in the Benelux region, so Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg, using evidence from interviews with media practitioners, 46. In total. So for this research you've actually done field work and you've spoken to these various newspaper peoples um, and you analyze the reactions according to a, a conceptual framework or analytical framework which resembles uh, McGee's framework when she talks about how mainstream parties respond to populist parties. So it's, 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 it's somewhat similar. Could you explain the different the different categories, if you like, of response of media to populist red right wing parties. Yes, yes. Uh, so basically, I interviewed all these. I went into the newsrooms and I interviewed the editors and chiefs of these newspapers, but also some radio stations and TV stations. And I basically wanted to know, okay, so how does it work? How do you deal with populism in your uh, newsroom? And uh, I found these patterns, and uh, I really there were clear patterns in the different regions uh, on how they dealt with the populist radical right. And um, I then indeed uh, drew my inspiration from the literature on how parties, mainstream parties deal with populist radical right. And um, I came up with these three categories. And it's important to note that these are ideal types. So in reality, it's not always super easy to say which category they fit in but they're definitely patterns and um, they are as follows. So the first way in which media can choose to deal with the populist radical right is what I call demarcation. And this really what this is, is uh, media practitioners can choose to isolate far right politicians by treating them as sort of pariah. And the aim of the strategy, and this is actually really important, the aim is not to ignore them, to silence them completely, but the aim is to uh, basically uh, isolate them. So to make clear that the ideas and the policies that they bring lie completely outside of the boundaries of democratic discourse. Um, and uh, an example of this would be a cordon sanitaire, which is a, a term that fits nicely in our times because this comes from the medical jargon and it basically means a guarded line that you put in place to prevent the spread of an infectious disease. But in this case, it is a guarded line that journalists can put in place to prevent the spread of extremism. So that would be the first category. Um, and then there's a second category, and that is what I call confrontation. So the idea here is that um, media practitioners can choose to oppose or demonize Parties. So they can take a confrontational stance by trying to delegitimize their policies through overtly critical news coverage. Um, there is a, an interview that I always show with uh, on BBC Question Time where a, a um, far-right Brit, British um, politician is interviewed, and this is really a textbook case of demarcation. So where the interviewer tries to uh, there's a Dutch term, ontmaskere, so take off the mask of the extremists that they are interviewing and really trying to show that the, the radical ideas behind them. Um, and then there's a third category, and that is accommodation. And you can see a trend here, you know, it, it's a continuum. It goes from completely putting them offside to confronting them and then accommodating them. And accommodation is really where journalists try to um, in a way, appease the populist radical right, uh, offering them a platform. In the extremist case, it would really be uh, using some of the same rhetoric, incorporating some of their rhetoric into their own news coverage, so emphasizing the idea of the pure people versus the corrupt elite, 
this type of thing. Um, yeah, but so yeah, again, these are ideal types and ideal strategies, and in reality, it's a bit more difficult to disentangle. Yeah, what I found interesting, you can sort of compare it with geese, as I said, strategies of dismissing, just ignoring the, the far right completely, accommodating them, which which would be uh, yeah the accommodation strategies. But with the media, it's slightly different. I felt because it's not necessarily that they agree with everything they say, but rather that they provide a platform for, for these parties to 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 have to to say yeah. what they want or, or, or to, to highlight the, the points in their program. Um, and what are you, you compare these different countries and also the, the two regions within Belgium. And one thing you show is that uh, these strategies may also change over time. So in some countries, the media has actually become more friendly towards the, the radical right-wing parties than they yeah. were. Uh, can you sort of summarize what you what you find the main differences between these different countries yeah yeah so if i had to say it in one sentence i would say that um of course in wallonia the french-speaking part of belgium and in luxembourg the two non-cases in my view uh, where there is no right-wing populist challenger no credible charismatic leader of the likes of geert wilders or nigel farage um, that here, media practitioners in general adhere to this demarcation strategy, the first one. But then in the Netherlands and in Flanders, where there is a quite successful populist radical right, um, you see that the media over time has become more accommodative. So really moved from demarcation to confrontation, and now they are clearly accommodating them. Mm. Um, and yeah, if I go in a bit more detail, so in Luxembourg, Luxembourg is a bit of a yeah, that's a bit of a niche country. That's actually where I'm from originally. And here you see that media practitioners, when I asked them, how do you deal with it? They all sort of said, well, we choose to uh, not really give them a platform. We think that uh, we shouldn't give too much voice to these tendencies, but there's not a formal agreement. It's not that all the news uh, uh, editors have come together and said, okay, we will, we will uh, never give them a platform. It's more that this kind of doesn't fit with their norms and values and also the the media system in luxembourg is not very commercialized there are many press subsidies there are many newspapers and they they are not really in this um this like battle over viewers and readers to attract to sensationalize as mm -hmm. you see in the british tablet press for instance so this really helps explain why media partitioners opt for this demarcation yeah so Bologna is a bit more of um uh, it's it's like a stricter case in the sense that there there is a strict agreement, a formal agreement between media practitioners to really um, never give a voice to uh, far right parties. So and, and th this is really what's kind of unique about this region in Europe in the sense that uh, media practitioners have really sat down and and they saw what happened in Flanders where there was a rise of a populist radical right party. And they said, okay, we will do everything that this doesn't happen here. How can we make sure it doesn't happen? Let's kind of put this into writing and let's um, sort of, um, yeah, remind ourselves of this. And they've kind of come up with a formal um, a document that says, okay, we will never do this. They've really made it clear that they will never do it. And they re this goes so far. I mean, one example that really struck me was that, um, when they, they obviously, they are the, the public service broadcaster in French speaking Belgium. They obviously um, showed the electoral, the, the election debate between Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen in France. But they did so with a delay because if they did it actually live, it would in a way conflict with their policy not to give a platform to far right because Marine Le Pen, in their view, is clearly a far right politician. And, it doesn't mean they don't feature them. They do talk a lot about them. They just never put them on live stream. They would never invite them to the TV studio to have a seat at the table. So yeah, if I understand you correctly, the media environment or culture in both Luxembourg and Wallonia, where you don't see a strong radical right-wing party, is more hostile towards, towards these parties in the first place. Very, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, this is kind of speculation, but as we've seen in Wallonia and the Netherlands, 
the media actually became less hostile once a radical right-wing party broke through. So if you speculate, would you expect the same thing to happen in Wallonia and Luxembourg, that media gradually becoming less hostile because, uh, in fact, the right-wing populist party is... Yeah, you already put your finger on a very sore spot, which is this chicken or egg question, right? Which comes first? So can I actually make a case that it is because of the media strategy that in Luxembourg and in Wallonia there is no far right? Um, this, yeah, this is a really tricky one. Um, and of course, it's the, the sort of $1 million question, because that's what we want to know. Is this a golden bullet? And I don't think it is. And I think we shouldn't overemphasize the role of the media. But um, what's really important to note is that uh, in Wallonia, the, and, and also actually in Luxembourg to some extent, it's not just the media, but also mainstream parties. They have both taken this view that they strictly demarcate the far right. Um, they consistently put them uh, offside. And I think what's really key to answering your question is the timing element. So I would really say that of course, it's easy for media to say we don't give a platform if, if there is not a charismatic leader, but um, the timing element is so crucial because if you decide before they become really big to do that and to consistently do that, so if the cold on is completely airtight in the sense that media and mainstream parties consistently say we don't, we don't want to give them the oxygen of publicity, then so in the earlier phases of a party's life cycle, they're the, the populist radical right is really dependent on media coverage to gain uh, visibility and legitimacy. So if they are if they are sort of never given that chance in the earlier time of their um, uh, of their uh, electoral trajectories, then you sort of nip them in the butt. So you you kind of cut them before they become big enough to matter. And um, that's why I would say, especially in Valonia, where these rules are so formalized and so strong, um, that I really would put my, I would kind of, if I had to put it bet, I would say, no, there, there won't be a far right party there. Because there was, so, and this is kind of a cool in, uh, example, there was a party, the Parti Populaire, which was he, um, led by Michel Modric Kamen, and he um, has his own YouTube channel, he's very interesting. He was sometimes called the Belgian Donald Trump. And he never really managed to break through. And it was because he was sort of consistently ignored by the media. And uh, yeah, there's very little coverage on him. He's not really, he, he really had a problem getting visibility. And I think that this really has to do partly with the media. So yeah, as, uh, as you would claim, uh, when I listen to you, the media does have a role to play in, in the legitimization or the delegitimization of, of such parties. The yeah. media may not control what we think, but uh, yeah, it might still give attention to these parties, make make their topics more salient, if you like. Yeah, or, exactly. Or yeah. Obstruct, obstruct this process. Yeah. What 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 some of my students might think now, yeah, okay, we, we, we're talking about these old media newspapers, radio, TV, but don't people nowadays get a lot of news from social media and have this, this new form of communication, which a lot of scholars have argued and a lot of pundits have, have argued social media is very good for populists because, for instance, Twitter, they need to... Uh, they, they need to sell their message in a number, uh, in, a, in a short number of, of characters, and this is good for populists because they they tend to use more simplistic language, and they can uh, engage more directly with the people. It's sort of a top-down, not only top-down, but also a bottom-up sort of medium where where people can really engage, and this is sort of the new. A very suitable medium, if you like, for for for, for populist parties. So, so do you think that uh, your your findings still matter, if you like, in in the contemporary day and age of social media? Yeah, also a great question, and and I had to persuade reviewers in a way that that um, that old media still matter. But I actually do think that old media still matter, and I think, well, it's absolutely true what you say that. Social media is important and social media uh, in a way is very fitting for populists because it has lower entry barriers. They can directly communicate with the angry voters and the ordinary people um, and the mediary is kind of taken away. 
Um, but I think it is overrated in the sense that there are some things that social media cannot do that traditional media can do. And that is um, above all legitimized. So um, social media cannot take away the stigma of extremism. That's only something that old media can do. And if we think about it, there, there's, it's often said that Twitter made Trump or you know, Twitter really was the, the, the reason to understand why uh, the US now has a populist radical right president. But I think that if it had just been Twitter, um, if the, the problem really came when the tweets were picked up by the mainstream media. So there was a lot of mainstream media who um, launched onto these tweets, these catchy tweets and publicized them. And that really gave him a platform. So um, it, I, I do think that old media still play a role. And actually when I was interviewing journalists, they said that social media puts them, uh, gives them a really um, a bit of a problem because obviously they read the tweets that these politicians send out into the world. and then they have to think really quickly, okay, what do we do with this tweet? Do we pick it up? Do we publicize it? Or do we let it go? But if we don't pick it up, but our competition does, then we have a problem. So it puts journalists really um, in a tricky position. How much attention should they give to these tweets? Um, so, but, but to really answer your question, I think that, um, yeah, old media does still matter. Of course, the question is how, for how long, because, our electorates are also aging, voters are becoming older, and the old voters, they do still read newspaper and watch TV, but I know that younger people don't. And the question is that maybe in 40 years, do media still matter? Like, is, is, uh, are journalists still gatekeepers, or are they meant to be just neutral transmitters of information that sort of just kind of pass on um, what's happening in the world? So yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer. No, we as political scientists, we have to be very careful in making such predictions anyway, because uh, yeah, this remains difficult uh, for us. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. I think that that's a, that, that's a really nice clarification of your article and also kind of a look into the future and, and how, your, <laughs> how your findings may still be very relevant in, in, in the contemporary day of, of social media. Because it need me, the head of traditional media, I'm also convinced, still still play have this very important gatekeeping function that they still have the, the tweets of Trump do not become popular because he puts them on Twitter but because the the, the old media if you like um, uh, yeah repeat them and, and magnify this message message if you like do you have any final thoughts on, on this matter Leonie that you'd like to share well the one thing I was thinking about still is that um, the one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that in general, the media has changed a lot over the last years. Um, that's maybe something worth thinking about. So uh, in the past, there were very few public service broadcasting stations, but we've seen now commercialization and privatization, which has changed the function of news and of journalists in our society. So it raises this question that I mentioned earlier already. So what kind of, um, what is the role of journalists in democratic society? And do they just are is there a role to just sort of neutrally transmit information and it's then for you as a viewer or reader to decide what's right or wrong or uh, are they really gatekeepers who need to keep information or um yeah not withhold information but filter out uh, information that doesn't form part of a democratic society so um and my my research shows that journalists in different countries and operating in different media systems have very different views about this. So in the Netherlands and Flanders, they really think that, no, this, this is for the viewer to decide. We are just mm -hmm. journalists and we, have, we, give, we let our viewers and readers decide. Otherwise, it's really intellectually quite boring. Whereas in Bologna and in Luxembourg, journalists have a bit of a different view of themselves in the society. So they think really that it's their job to maintain democracy. And this, of course, changes then the output of the media. Yeah. This, does this relate, would you say, to this framework of Helen and Mancini? They have identified these different media systems in Europe, but also uh, the US, uh, liberal and uh, the more, um, the, the system in, that dominates Northern Europe, if you like, where, where journalists have more this idea of we, we need to 
be kind of the gatekeepers or we we must uh, fight fake news, etc. Is, is, is there sort of, do you see that still back, that, that model that they previously introduced? Yeah, I, I definitely think that, um, well, in more countries, we're moving towards the US and American system where it's becoming increasingly um, po political competition in general is becoming more of a competition over media attention. And then the electorate is acting a bit like um, an audience that is watching a, a play at a theater. And I think that um, indeed in these more commercialized systems, the um, journalists have different um, yeah, motivations or are forced in a way to have different motivations than in a system where they don't have to think so much about will this sell. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in, in Luxembourg, for instance, where there is more money for media, journalists have the liberty to think more about, okay, what do I want to cover today? Not so much about, okay, this must sell. And that really, I think, changes the social function of, of, of journalism. And at least it raises questions about what the role of journalism is in our society. Yeah. And that's me coming from the Netherlands. I'm still quite surprised to, to see the, the media culture in, in the UK, where indeed it's, it's more commercialized and it's more about that's selling newspapers than, yeah. than it's in, in many continental countries in, in Northern Europe. Oh. Yeah. Thanks very much for this conversation, Leonie. This, this was very interesting, uh, I found, and uh, I'm sure my students also think the same. Well, I hope so. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>